Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We did indeed give uh, Mary the more difficult text uh, to look at this morning, but we are still in that the area, the overall area of the feasts that we began yesterday with my general overall talk on the feasts and Mary's just looked at one of them and if you open your booklets on page 22 just to remind you where we are I don't know whether you're aware but I hope you are that um, Pina and Mary and myself have organized the input of this course so that across these two days you will get a, a fairly uh, intensive reading of the whole gospel from beginning to end. You may not have come to grips with all of the detail but you'll have a picture of the whole whole thing and you may go to Mass on a Sunday and somebody will start reading from John 6 as we will next year for five long weeks and you'll say I know where that comes from. That's the section on the feasts in John's gospel. And what's going on there is this, both pastorally and theologically, what's happening. So now, because of this time you've spent together, there is uh, this deeper awareness, maybe not of every chapter and verse, but of a big picture and some of the things that we've taken out from the bigger picture to do as sort of examples for you uh, within the um, a more detailed analysis. But I want you to stay there on verse, page 22 for a while. And what we're looking at today, this morning, is another section from the feasts. So I'm going to look at John 9. Jesus is the light of the world. And if you're on page 22, you will see under section 2 in Romans, we are now up to section 3 in the small Roman letters. Jesus and the principal feasts of the Jews. We've already done the prologue. We've begun, we had a look at the opening days. We've done Cana to Cana. And within that Cana to Cana, Mary did a study of the Samaritan woman. We've then had a look, an overlook of the whole of the Jesus and the principal feasts of the Jews. Mary has had a look at the Passover feast. I'm now going to look at a section of tabernacles. And I want you to notice that passage from the Leo the Great, which is a, a passage that I took from Leo the Great to describe what I think is going on across this whole section. Lord, you drew all things to yourself so that all nations everywhere in their dedication to you might celebrate in a full clear sacramental rite what was done in the Jewish temple in signs and shadows. So there's not a break. It's not as if that's all gone. But this is a sign and a shadow of what is done fully within the Christian mystery. I talked to you yesterday in general about um, the Feast of Tabernacles and I pointed out the major elements in that celebration. I talked about it being a feast of water, about it being a feast of light, about it being a feast of very intense messianic expectation, and it being a feast about a commitment to the one true God. In John 9, we get a number of those themes come to a head. And if I get a, a chance, I'll just glance forward into John 10, 1 through to 21 to show you a, f the, a further issue being resolved in a Christian sense uh, in this Joannine celebration of the feasts of the Jews. John 9 uh, follows immediately after seven where Jesus claimed that he was living water and eight where Jesus claimed that he was the light of the world so he says that he is living water 
that he is life of the world, light of the world. And in verse, in chapter 9, through this miracle story, he shows how he acts as living water and how he acts as the light of the world. So the fact of Jesus being living water and light is proclaimed in 7 and 8 and how it happens is, is shown in 9. Now we'll be able to read this text fairly closely because it's not as long as John 6 and that's why we gave Mary John 6. <laughs> It begins with a rather lengthy but very profound uh, introduction that runs from verses 1 to 5. And it runs directly on from the end of chapter 8. As Mary said to you, those headings that you have do not come from the authors. And you may be even more surprised when you hear, nor do the chapters and verses. The chapters and verses all come from the Middle Ages. There were various attempts, but a person by the name of Robert Stephanus put these chapters and verses on, and they become established in the 13th and 14th century. And they work pretty well. But as chapter 8 ends... So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, and going along he saw a man. In fact, the, the very first the verb there is a, is a present participle. So he goes out of the temple, exelthen, from the temple, kai paragon, and going on. So it's almost one sentence rolling on. So he walks out of the temple and he is walking on and he sees a man born from birth from birth this is important this is not the story about a man who gets back something that he once had this is a new creation for this man so he's never seen before and now he sees again. The other major miracle of the gift of sight in John's Gospel, sorry, in the synoptic tradition, is you remember the man in Mark 8 who sees, but he sees hum human beings, but they look like trees, which indicates, of course, that he saw once before because he knows what a human being looks like and he knows what a tree looks like. This is not the restoration of a former sight. This is a man who was, has been blind, ek genetis, from birth, from his very moment of birth, always blind. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents that he was born blind this is a part of Jewish thinking that has a good starting point and the good starting point is that God doesn't create anything that's wrong anything that's imperfect anything that's bad so if somebody's born blind somebody has sinned or else you wouldn't have this defect. And so either his parents have sinned, and thus he's born blind as a consequence, but the Jews even had an idea of prenatal sin. <laughs> Somehow or other, the child, before it was even born, sinned. And you will see, so we'll see later in the story when the the Pharisees and the Jews have decided that they don't want this man, they will say to him, you were born in utter sin. In other words, they make the judgment that his blindness comes from sinfulness. Jesus cuts through all that discussion and says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, 
this whole situation that you see in front of you is going to be for the manifestation of God's works. It's going to be so that you can see the work of God taking place in and through the action of Jesus. The revelation of the way God works as water and light. And then he says to his disciples, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is a very beautiful sentence, but uh, it also has its technicalities. If you all got, those of you who have the New Revised Standard Version in front of you, or even other texts, will probably see at the beginning of verse 4 when it says, we must work the works of him. You might get a footnote which says, other ancient authorities read, I must work the works. And so in the early texts, the Greek manuscripts, both are there. The majority position, largely because it is the more difficult reading, we must work the works of, of the one who sent me. It would be normal to say, I must work the works of the one who sent me. It's more difficult to say we would go for we. And I think it's we because I think it involves everyone into the task of the ongoing presence of the light of Christ in the world. Let me go back on the text then. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Once the physical Jesus returns to the Father, well, the night should descend, shouldn't it? Yes. But it doesn't, doesn't it? Because we continue to work the works of the one who sent him. That we associates all of us with the task of keeping the light of Jesus alive in the world. Okay? So that's the theological introduction. Very challenging. Very challenging. So we are involved with the mission of being the light of the world as Jesus was the light of the world. And as long as he is in the world, there will be light. When he is absent, there will be darkness. We have a responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, to keep the light turned on. Okay, now that's the theological introduction. Then we begin to move into the miracle. Now this is a very beautiful story. There are certain places in John where he shows himself to be a consummate storyteller. This is one of them. John 11, the Lazarus story is another one. The passion story which Mary will look at uh, later today is another one. There are places where he shows that he's a magnificent storyteller and as I said to you yesterday he's been honing this story for a long time. If you follow John 9 carefully you see that it moves from different scenes and each scene is determined by the presence of two major actors and the first one is the blind man and Jesus. When he had said this, he spat on the ground, he made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes. The use of saliva in healing eyes is traditional in antiquity. <laughs> there are even stories of the Emperor Vespasian curing people with spittle. This sounds very strange to us, but if you spend any time in the Middle East, and some people here have, you will see that all of the Bedouins, all of those people who wander through the Judean waste, etc., they almost all have eye problems because of the dust and the heat, etc. 
And what do they do all the time? Spittle on their eyes. When you get a nick on your hand, what's the first thing you do? Put it to your mouth. This is a... Spittle is an ancient and natural antiseptic. That's why our mouths cure quickly after dental treatment. Because you've got this continual presence of a natural antiseptic. So the use of the spittle is traditional. But in the John miracle, he doesn't just use spittle, he mixes it with soil to create mud so that the man will wash. So he's got to create this muddy thing on his eyes to send him off to wash. Very brief, very brief command from Jesus and response from the man. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And then John adds, which means the sent one. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. He sends him off to the pool of Siloam. Do you remember when I was talking about the, um, the feasts, I said that there is only one place in the whole of Jerusalem where you have living water. And that's the pool of Siloam. Living water that gurgles up from under the ground. This is the only place where you have the living water. Jesus said in John 9 that he is the living water. He sends this man to Siloa. He sends this man to the living water. And externally he goes and washes himself in the pool of Siloa. But in parenthesis, John wants to tell us, his readers, it's not really the water. Siloam really means the sent one. It's contact with Jesus that generates this miracle. Not a miracle through water, but Siloam, which means the sent one. Well, it doesn't really, but it's near enough. The Hebrew for the sent one is Shiluah. This is what you call popular etymology. It's not the same, but it's near enough. <laughs> It'll do. It'll do. The point that John wants to make is the miracle is through the washing of the water. But the water really represents or is his contact with the sent one. And by this stage in the gospel, particularly after John 7 and 8, Jesus has been powerfully presented as the sent one of the Father. So it is contact with Jesus that generates this miracle, we know, because we have read the prologue, we have read the chapters that go before, and we now are aware that it's this contact with the living water who is in fact Jesus. That's the first little scene. The next scene is a meeting between the man born blind and his neighbours. The neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. This happens all across the Gospel of John. When John does some very important revealing miracle or says something revealing in one of the discourses, almost inevitably people divide. Some say yes, some say no. And a little later in this chapter we're even going to find the word schisma. The presence of Jesus creates yay, no, yes, no, schism. So here it's the people who see the evidence of Jesus' miraculous contact with this man 
and they can't decide. But they kept asking him, how then were your eyes open? We've already heard the story once, you're going to hear it a few more times. He answered, the man called Jesus. put both up there because in this chapter it changes. Okay. The man called Jesus made mud spread it on my eyes and said to me go to Siloam and wash then I went and washed and received my sight then they said to him who is he and he said I do not know that's the first encounter where he tells them that a man called Jesus. Where is he? I don't know. They brought him to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath day. This is another problem. When Jesus made the mud. Not allowed to do that. He did a little job. And opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, third time you've heard this story, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. Because he works on a Sabbath can't possibly be from God but others said how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs so at least they believe that the sign happened you with me they say he shouldn't have done this it was a Sabbath they say well he mightn't be might he can't be a sinner because he's done this incredible sign. So they believe that the sign happened. This is where the Pharisees, Jews are at the start of the story. And then the next words I told you a minute ago, right at the end of verse 16, and they were divided. The Greek word is schisma. There was a schism among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes, your eyes he opened, and he said, He is a prophet. You notice a little bit of progress is going on. The man called Jesus, he is a prophet. Here, he can't be from God because he worked on a Sabbath, but at least the miracle happened. How did that work? Next episode with two characters in it, three really, but the parents is one set of characters and the Pharisees. The Jews, we've got this change in terminology here, Keep mate, they means the same. There's reasons for this, but I won't go into it. Did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight they did not believe in the sign. Ah. So to prove that there was no sign, as I said to you in our very first lecture, 
they go to the people who would be best informed about whether he was born blind or not, and that's his parents. And I've been through this text with you, the parents buy out. They do not want to decide who it was or how it happened because if anyone was to confess that Jesus was the Christ, they would have been thrown out of the synagogue. They, they say, ask him, he is of age, he can speak for himself. But at this stage, these, the Pharisees are beginning to also go in another direction. To start with, they at least believe in the sign. Now they say there is no sign. And so they test the parents, and the interrogation of the parents is, is quite nasty. If you read it in the original, it says, how can you say that he was born blind? This, of course, uh, is a common practice in antiquity and, and even in modern day, where a, an infant is maimed at birth so that they can spend their whole lives as beggars. First time I saw it was when I first went to Europe in the mid-60s in Colombo. And you see these little children with cut off arms and legs and the, that's their life. The families do that and they spend their whole lives as beggars. They're professional beggars. So that's what these parents are really being accused of. He wasn't born blind, you made him blind. So that's what's, it's, it's a nasty, nasty little interrogation, this one. So after the meeting between the, the, the Pharisees and the Jews and the parents for a second time they called the man who had been blind and they said to him give glory to God now that is like an oath formula from now on it's like they've just taken the Bible in their hand and said I swear to hold, tell the whole truth of nothing but the truth so give glory to God is an oath formula from now on he's under oath we know This man is a sinner. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know. I do not know whether he's a sinner. But I know one thing for fact. I was once blind and now I can see. And then they asked for the fourth time, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And you get this marvelous, ironic, I would even say sarcastic response from the man, I've told you already. And you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to come his disciples? <laughs> So these people are moving further away from becoming disciples. This man is moving towards becoming a disciple. And in the midway path, he says, do you guys want to join me over here? <laughs> sort of an ironic, sarcastic jibe at the Pharisees, which doesn't make them terribly happy. Then this a very important passage. Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple. You are his disciple. Oop. Let me get my technology right here. Uh, you could actually put in here, couldn't we? Disciples? Question mark. Sarcasm, you are his disciple. That's the way he's going. He's moving in that direction. We are disciples of Moses. Now I want you to remember what I said to you in that very first, very first session in which, I, when I talked about the Jews.
And the next verse is very important. This is what, it, remember I talked about the problem with the Jews, in inverted commas, if they are within a closed religious system and they are not prepared to look anywhere else. Verse 29. We know We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he has come from. They know so much, but the only thing they don't know is the old determining thing that they should know if they are to understand Jesus. And that is where he comes from. We know, don't we? How do we know? Good. We've all read the prologue. And we can see this man is moving in the right direction where these are getting further and further away. Why? Because they know so much. They're locked into their little world. And the one thing they don't know is where Jesus comes from, which is what they need to know if they're going to have joy and life and peace that is promised by Jesus with this gift of eternal life. But they're not open to that. We know that God has spoken through Moses and that'll do us thank you very much. Don't bother me with any of this Jesus stuff. The man answered, here is an, is an astonishing thing. Very true. Beautiful story. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. They've accused him of being a sinner. But he does listen to one who worships him and obeys him, his will. And never since the world began has it, be heard, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. This is true. This is the only biblical story where a man who is born blind gets sight. All the others had sight restored. This man has a new creation. And never has this happened before. Now he begins to ask the very important question. If this man were not from God, Here we are. This is, the, this is the question, isn't it? How do we know? Prologue. prologue. We've read the prologue. He's beginning to move and join us. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The result of the Pharisees, the response of the Pharisees, you were born in utter sin. Back to verse 2, eh? Who sinned here, his mothers or him? They've made up their own mind. They don't care who it is. It's either his parents or himself. But whatever it is, the fact that he was born blind means that he is born in utter sin. And will you dare to teach us? Closed religious system. And they throw through him out. And this is an acting out in the life an experience of the man born blind of what was said in 922. The parents would not speak up because they were afraid of the Jews. Because if anyone was to confess that Jesus is the Christ, they would have been thrown out of the synagogue. And that's what happens to him. He has now come to suggest that this man might be from God and that's why he can do these things. So they throw him out. There's been some very important studies done on this. A little bit overstated. But see in the experience of the man born blind in John 9, the actual lived experience of the Johannine community at the end of the century. They are also making their journey of faith. 
And eventually he comes and makes his commitment to Jesus and they throw him out. And that's what was happening to the Johannine Christians. They're moving towards faith and eventually saying that Jesus is the Christ and they're being thrown out of the synagogue. The Greek for they threw him out is really strong. Ex ebalon out on exon. The word ex means out of. They put it before the verb and then they put it at the end as well. So they threw him out quite forcibly down the stairs. That's adding something to the text. There's no stairs in the text, but <laughs> just to create the idea that there's this physical chucking him out of the temple. So that is that end of that little scene. Now another pair emerge. Jesus and the man born blind. You notice all through this, Jesus has been absent. This began with the friends of the man. Jesus is being tried. Who Jesus is, is the central question all the time. Even though he's not there. Who is this guy? Well then, in anticipation of the next chapter, where Jesus will be presented as the Good Shepherd, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had driven him out and he found him. He goes out and finds him. He seeks out the man born blind. And he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Is this title again? This term, Son of Man, Mary referred to my interest in this. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the use of the Son of Man in the fourth gospel. Now, if you've got another six days, we can talk about that. <laughs> but Mary's already summed it up. It's intimately associated with the revelation of God's love for us in and through the death and resurrection, the death of Jesus, the physical lifting up of the Son of Man. Just to remind you of three Johannine passages that we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that all who believe in him may have life. Or in 828, and I, sorry, and when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that ego ami, I am he. And then in chapter 12 he says, and I, when I am lifted up, I will draw everyone to myself. So there's this lifting up of the Son of Man, which is at one and the same time Jesus' death, his exaltation, and the place where he draws people to himself and founds community. Do you believe in this Son of Man? Pretty big call, eh? This, of course, is a, again a beautiful piece of uh, catechesis to a struggling church, struggling with being thrown out of the church, thrown out of the synagogue. And the man asks, a very good question. And who is he, sir? Who is he, sir? A respectful term. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus responds with two major Johannine words. You have seen him and he is the one speaking with you. You're looking at this man, Jesus, and you're listening to his word. This is the revelation of God in and through the human experience of the word of Jesus and the sight of Jesus. The physical experience of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man, who is standing in front of you. You have seen him, and he is the one speaking to you. Very important, Joe and Anna words. God reveals through the speaking of Jesus and through the actions of Jesus, especially in the lifting up on the cross. And that's all the man needs. Lord, above in verse 36 he said, Who is he, sir? He uses the same word now, but with a capital. Curie becomes Curie with a capital K. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And the word to worship is proskuneo. He falls down on his knees. The sort of uh, attitude of faith which indicates 
an acceptance of the revelation of God that took, takes place in the Son of Man. Here we have the story of a man who moves not just from physical blindness to physical sight, but from blindness of the man called Jesus to a, a total acceptance of Jesus as the Son of Man. Here we have a group going in the other way. They at least started by accepting the sign. But they've now got to the stage where they know so much, except what they should know, that they are in fact going nowhere. And that's the way this section, this chapter ends. Look at verse 39. I came into this world for judgment. And this is what's happening here, isn't it? The schisma. Eh? Jesus speaks, Jesus makes himself known, and they divide. That's a schisma. When Jesus says, I came for judgment, he uses the Greek expression, a schisma, which means to create a crisis. A schisin. I came to create a crisis. And that's what's happened. There's one side of the crisis and there's the other. So that those who do not see, may see. And those who do see, may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But because you say, We see, your blindness remains locked in their closed religious system. They know everything. And so you've got this man who doesn't know much, but what he does know is that God works through a man like Jesus. If he's not from, he if he's not from God, he couldn't do these things. God finds him, asks him if he believes in the Son of Man. Who is he? the one talking to you, the one you can see, Lord, I believe. Surely we're not blind. Yes, you are. So they have gone in the other direction. They've gone from at least a belief in a miracle to a non-recognition that they are in fact blind, even though they think they know everything. Okay? Beautiful way of telling a story, isn't it? I just want to add one little bit. I think I've got five minutes, haven't I? Yeah. You had that ten minutes ago. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> what time am I supposed to finish? You, now. You've got, you've got a block of this long. We'll work it out. It, it's more of a homily. He's much, much easier than... Where, where are you, Joan? <laughs> He's much softer than you are. <laughs> have, have a word to him at the break, will you? <laughs> Fix him up. I just want to point out to you that this really is at the end of this section of the gospel because it runs on into chapter 10. Because in chapter 10, Jesus continues to criticize Jewish leadership by using the language of the good and the bad shepherd, which he brings into the discourse from the book of Ezekiel. In, John, in Ezekiel 34 and 38, he talks about good shepherds and bad shepherds. And bad shepherds are the leaders of Israel who do not deal with their flock the way they should. And he basically says, you leaders of Israel are bad shepherds, thieves and robbers. And there's even reference, I think, to the year 70, when they fled and left the people to the wolf. Could be Rome, eh? Possible Rome there. But the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, why do I mention this? Because yesterday I said that across this part of the gospel we have water, light, and Messiah. Nowhere in this gospel to this point has Jesus ever accepted that he is the Messiah in Jewish terms. 
the shepherd, the good Davidic shepherd, is a Jewish messianic expectation. For the first time in the story, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am your Messiah. And we say, oh, that's new. But then he blows it apart by saying, who lays down his life for his sheep. That's never said of the Davidic messianic shepherd. Never. Jesus lays down his life for his sheep, as we'll see later, and not for these sheep only, but to gather into one sheep from other folds. So in this nine and running into ten, we get the resolution of Jesus as living water. You see it happening. Light. You see it happening. Messiah. Sure, Jewish Messiah, Jewish Shepherd, but who lays down his life for his sheep. Thanks for the extra 15 minutes, Des. <laughs>